Welcome, everyone. We are going to get started by calling this meeting, this study session, to order. And the topic today is school safety. So I have a big group here supporting us. Thank you for being here. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wessel to start. Excellent. This well, uh, President Miner and, and Governing Board members, uh, it's great to see you this afternoon for another study session. And our topic today is school safety. And we think it's very fitting for a couple of reasons that we haven't talked about it around this table much recently. And we're in the midst of this whole master facility plan, bond expenditure, uh, and it, I, I think it's very fitting to talk about what our schools look like. <coughs> have we done for school safety and security up until this point? What's our philosophy about school safety and security? And we've got some experts in the room that are going to lead us through that process. And so I'm going to kick it over to Al Moore and Holly Williams to you know, walk us through this study session. So Holly, it is all yours. Thank you. So earlier this fall, we brought to you um, some plans for bond projects. And um, 10 of those projects are, well, actually 11 of them, are school um, front office remodels with the idea of safety as our focus. So today we're going to talk about that um, because we've had lots of lively debate about what should our schools look like when you enter. What, how secure should they look? How should they feel? What should be our focus on that? So Al and I have debated at length, and um, we have some ideas to share with you today, but we want your feedback on it. And so in the room with us, we have, of course, our Director of Operations, Todd Ford, and Ron Romo, our Director of Construction, who've also been debating with us. And um, Sue Gray, you want to wave, Sue? <laughs> Sue, is, Sue is our architect partner who is designing these schools. So she's here to listen to your ideas, to, tonight, she wants to gather the ideas, and then she'll go back to um, design the offices for each of these schools. And, and by the end of this presentation, I have the list to show you the exact schools, and you'll understand why one answer doesn't fit for everybody once you see the list of schools. So it's more tonight about developing a philosophy around um, school safety and design, less about I want this on every campus, because it won't work on every campus, and we'll talk a little bit about and please stop us at any time if you have questions, and Al and I are going to kind of bounce back and forth. So when we talk about school design, um, there's a, a, an idea of um, crime prevention through environmental design, that you can control some of the security features by controlling the environment. And the idea is that you um, use these concepts of natural surveillance, access control, the image, and the territorial reinforcement. And I'll, Point some of them out as we go through this, but the idea is that this is a um, in in Sue's world, this is a thing <laughs> they, that that designers and architects pay attention to is that you can design for safety features and maybe not even know that 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 you've created those things. But you should pay attention to the features as you think about how how we are getting ready to remodel offices. And I included the picture of Sandy Hook there. That's the new Sandy Hook. So that you can see that it's not a locked down, no window place, even though they had great tragedy there. That, that they kept in mind that um, the aesthetics and some of the features in this um, uh, crime prevention through environmental design is, is focused in the Sandy Hook new design. They have what, Scott, would you tell me, it's called a, a virtual moat around it. So they have a safety, uh, safety perimeter around it that, that um, is, you wouldn't even know it to look at it, but it's a very safe. As we think about this, though, before we get going, um, the safety committee has had quite a bit of conversation around how do we balance school safety and wellness? Because it's not just about the right hand of this graph, which is deter, detect, delay, and defend, but rather how are we paying attention to engagement and intervention and bullying prevention and all of those things over there, are counseling our, our SEI things. How are we balancing that out when we think about keeping kids safe? You know, what we learned in our parent um, engagement about the master plan is when you said, are our schools safe as a question to the parents, um, in the small groups, safety meant different things to them. Mm -hmm. It 
didn't Very mean so. fences and doors locked. It meant are they how do they feel about being on campus? It meant are the computers safe? It, it meant something different to everybody, and that was a, an eye opener, I think, for Scott and I both to say, oh, what we think safety is. We'll have a different definition of that. Well, and I think the kids redefine safety as well as they as we've had groups of students talk about like master plan and high schools and they talk a lot about wanting to create community and get to know each other. I think they see safety in that understanding of each other as opposed to blocks <coughs> and glass and fence and all that kind of stuff. Same, same, same message there, right? right? So, so that psychological impact and how they deal with each other is a factor in, in this conversation. I think Danielle helped me. Danielle from Mountain View here helped me on both of the student <laughs> activities over um, at Mesa High and Mountain View. I think you can say this too with, with good um, authority, but the students very much felt um, that they were that the campus is safe now, they wanted to be safer through social interaction. Am I saying that right? So that was important. But they always said that there needed to be a camera because there's always going to be some <laughs> <They did>. troublemaker <laughs> they did. that's going <laughs> to cause a problem once in a while. Kids at Mountain View would like us to have put in a parking structure with a social porch on top that adults don't go in, but they'll put a camera so we can keep an eye on them. That's how they like <laughs> that's it. That's how they got so, um, Cool. I mean, they were they were and they designed it and, and built it for us. So Did you tell them it wasn't going to happen? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, this was dreaming, Denny. This yeah. was dreaming. Yeah, I, I have it at my house. It's called. I'd shut that down. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Marcy, you shared an art article with us today that kind of lives in this world, right? About how do you balance the idea of keeping kids safe? and um, the psychological um, consequences of that. And Marcy shared an article with us today around um, lockdown drills and how, how do we practice these things and what impact does that have on students? So I'm gonna let Al talk about that a little bit because it's a, it's a big debate that's yes. happening in the world. This has been a topic of discussion for years on whether or not the lockdown drills, whether or not they should be announced or announced. So um, I've met with, you know, in trainings I've met with Colleagues in the Gilbert family. We all agree they should be unannounced, but they don't all do unannounced. Uh, we do, several other districts do. Uh, the police department supports an unannounced drill because we always tell them it's a drill, and then all of a sudden we have a real thing. They're going to freak out when they don't hear the word drill. Uh, so we just decided years ago that we were going to do unannounced drills. Uh, we tell them ahead of time you're going to have drills. We have ADE requires us to do four drills a year. Uh, they require one of those to be when the students are outside the classroom like during the recess. Or the class. uh, we tell them at the beginning of the year we're going to have four drills minimum this year, so it should be an expectation from them. Hope that reduces the anxiety. One of the things in this article uh, talks about they, uh, some uh, districts and other states were doing drills with uh, simulations with wax bullets and everything. I'm like, holy cow, we would never do anything like that. So we don't do any kind of reenactments. We don't yell and scream in there. When uh, we do a lockdown drill, uh, I, especially at the elementary schools, I emphasize to my guys, let's get these over with as soon as possible. Most of them are over within 10 minutes. Because we mainly want to just get them used to the fact that we have these drills, and drills take place, the lights go off, we stay quiet. Check a few doors to make sure that nobody forgot an unlocked door and that they were really so far away. Send the notification. And Try and our and best. And we've really worked at uh, coaching our principals to make quick communication. <coughs> I mean, some some communicate with the automatic messenger the moment that they go into a drill. So there isn't this, this notion of time passes, kids are on their phones in the classroom. So I don't think we're perfect at that yet, but we've really encouraged schools send out the communication when it happens. Yes, and, and I would support the minute we uh, the drill send the message. It doesn't mm -hmm. take that long. Or getting text messages. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I mean it, it's a it's a good debate. We will continue <coughs> to 
talk about this in our safety meetings and uh, listen to other people's opinions and experts' opinions. We certainly don't want to traumatize these kids. I will tell you that I have personally sat in on classrooms. Uh, the most recent one was a third grade class at Eisenhower. I wanted to see what happened in the classroom and kids didn't seem stressed out. The lights went off, the kids went in the corner very orderly, they were quiet. What about what about kids who have, have sensitivity to a disruption like that? Right on the team. So and we've got a, we've got a number we've got a number of students and, okay, right. and that and that number seems to be growing and I'm I'm really worried about the kids who don't understand what's happening and and those who may be very very stressed because of the situation. So for the last. Uh, well, about a year and a half. Uh, I finished last year, but uh, it took me about a year and a half to touch every school. But I went to every single staff meetings and I, I did a training on uh, our protocols. And one of the things I emphasize and I continue to emphasize with new employees is the students are going to follow our lead. If we stress out, they're going to stress out. If we stay calm, they're going to stay calm. When the lockdown drill was announced. It's announced over the intercom. It's not sirens and lights or anything like that. So really, I think it's up to the teacher to stay calm and explain to their kids what's going on. And in that third grade class that I sat in, that's exactly what she did. Very calm about it. And went well. So I think that's the key is making sure that our staff realizes these kids are going to react how we react. But Mrs. Hutchinson, I, I appreciate your thoughts on that. That just brings a greater awareness to us that if we are going to conduct unannounced drills, that maybe it's appropriate to do you know, training with those teachers in those unique environments to <coughs> certain things that they might be able to do to minimize, you know, a student feeling <coughs> out of sorts because it's not the thing that they do. We, we have to work at that. Better. Yeah, I'm also I'm also really concerned about the kids that are that are suffering from trauma. Yes. I so mean, this maybe, is this is this is something. Let's be real about what's happening to our kids. And our kids are not living in the Asian world anymore. That was a TV show in the 50s. <laughs> but um, I'm really worried about kids that suffer from trauma. And, and maybe it, Mrs. Really, it frightens me. Maybe that's Mrs. what Spotify they're going through. Share with us. Could you share a little bit, Teresa, with us what Leilani does with trauma informed um, teaching with, with groups of teachers? We do a lot of professional. You're right. Those kids have sensory sounds or walking down in classrooms. So usually for students, we have plans that we create uh, for them. So if there is a need, um, we have headphones so teachers know ahead of time. Or accommodation. We have, I was at the we had a parent who comes for every fire their child has lost their So there's a lot of plans that we do in our So we work closely to know when all of those drills. And we have many, many staff. I want to maybe you can speak to some of the schools that are trained in trauma informed care. Many of our full staffs have that training also. Yes, and and a key a key to all of this is um, if teachers can practice with their students when it's a drill, um, then when it's an emergency and it's not a drill, it's the real thing. The students will have practiced it enough that they can just go into the routine because. What we don't want to create is a situation where they always know when it's a practice and then when it's the real thing, everyone freaks out because it's the real thing because I didn't know ahead of time that this was going to happen. So the idea is to let the, the sensitive students know ahead of time when it's a drill 
But at some point during the year, they do do it without telling them ahead of time. Because the last thing we want is to be in an emergency situation and have like everybody freak out because we didn't know ahead of time this was coming. So this has got to be the real thing. So yes, training and practicing, but gradual release that as the year goes on, we do practice some that are not advertised ahead of time so that we know what that reaction is going to be when it's the real thing and we can still um, be prepared for it. And um, we would hope that it's never the real thing, um, but we want to be prepared for that as well when it happens unannounced. I, I, would, um, I don't want to take up anybody's time. I'd really like to talk to you about just just to use my mind because I'm, I'm wondering if this is really there's questions i have that i'd like to ask you as our as people respect you and i know you at every school and, and you've done the training so you've got a real handle on this and i, I really like to talk to you personally about, about this why so i'm better aware of it that'd be awesome uh, i would like to make one comment in this article that talks about whether or not this is effective I was told by law enforcement after Sandy Hook, they did a lockdown drill about a week prior to that incident. And they said that lockdown drill probably saved lives because that suspect was actually walking down the hallway, battling doors. And because they were quiet and the lights were off, he thought those wounds were empty. Finally, heard kids inside one of them. That's when he went in and broke, his, broke into that room. I was told by Homeland Security that was a substitute teacher who never got lockdown protocols. So just that example alone tells me that there's value to doing these drills. I mean, I, I did, Pete and I did them at Red Mountain all the time with our, with our students. And, uh, and, it, and it went along, as like you said earlier. I mean, you know, it's kids follow, follow you. And, it, and it's all about the teacher and training and the rapport that they have with their students. So, but I'd like to talk to you about it more. So I can understand that. Never had time to when we were teaching. <laughs> so just a reminder of the things that we've done so far as the, you know over the past several years um al and his team and the security um the, the construction department has have made some significant improvements on our campuses all the protocols have been updated um using uh mesa police as our as, as our helpers on that in, in um those planning sessions classrooms are remain locked in school and student session we um to to um, one of those uh, D's on that side were to deter, to, to, to be hard to say, to deter, uh, to slow down, right? To slow down somebody from being able to access a classroom. <clears throat> that there are new emergency management posters in place that they got rid of those flip charts. Now we have a standardized symbol. Oh, so there's one on the wall. You know. <laughs> so that's standardized across the district. They all look the same where, no, no matter where you go. We've got cameras increased uh, with increased coverage on all sites, and we're even in this bond of increasing those numbers more. Yes, our uh, high school, well, our elementary schools will have pretty close to 20. Our junior highs have the number 40s, and our high schools are getting close to about 100. And you now these are monitored not only by district security, but also at schools monitor them as well if yes. they have some of some flexible resources to do so. That's correct. They can log the uh, front office clerks can log on and a lot when I walk into schools a lot of times one of the clerks actually has the cameras up constantly monitoring. My dispatcher monitors them during the day. I have uh, somebody at night monitoring them. The, uh, the high schools, a lot of the high schools have assigned dispatcher who does nothing but monitor. You know you've been around here for quite a while. Well that makes you sound really old, but um, you've been around here for a few years. Do you believe cameras deter? I yeah, mean, is this a good move for us to make to, to just deter bad behavior? It's absolutely or? the best investment that we can make. Uh, a lot of principals tell me that kids think there's cameras everywhere. Right? And, <laughs> and even when there's hallways with, that don't have cameras, like a lot of our elementary schools, we don't have a lot of interior cameras because behavior isn't all the principals have to do is say, look, Johnny, you know we have cameras on these campuses. And boom, they get a confession. So, <laughs> and we have uh, actually experienced video footage of people coming out of our campus looking up at a camera. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I think we've seen a huge decrease in the graffiti. Graffiti, criminal <coughs> damage, uh, burglaries, almost non-existent. When I first got on the board 12 years ago, that was a bunch of $4 million dollars a year. I mean, that is huge. And we also, you know, the perimeter fencing we have and to create one point of entry to the schools. And um, many of our school offices uh, in, in the first bond, um, this last bond, excuse me, were um, remodeled with to control access. So we put in doors where we could, buzzer doors, um, created windows that can, can close quickly and, and secure offices. And so um, we kind of did the ones that were the low hanging fruit, right? The there were about were... eight schools that uh, you literally, when you walk in the front door of the school, we're gonna, we have a picture of one of them, walk in and you had to exit the hallway to get to the office. So we had people, strangers off the street just walking into our classes. We've secured those. I have a question about your posters, your emergency posters. Are those a standard for all school districts or is that something unique to <coughs> our school district? Did they and what they say on them is what I have. So I I would like to say that I invented that. <laughs> um, I actually copied that from a Sandy Hook Foundation, but a lot of the we changed some of the uh, icons on it to be more okay. relevant to our district. So I kind of recreated it. Uh, theirs had a lot more things on there that I thought weren't needed. Okay. Didn't really apply. Yeah. I uh, read it earlier in the year, and I remember there was some things. That maybe it's been changed since, but some things that I thought didn't apply even in Arizona. I don't know if that's the. I'm just naive. Well, I don't realize like, is there something apply. about a tornado or something like yeah. that? Yeah. So we, we get tornadoes. <laughs> big <laughs> wind. <laughs> I guess we could get it. Like a big monsoon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and when we talked about that, we decided to leave those on there just because even though they're rare, it is possible. So. Okay. And this there actually is a fault line that runs diagonally right here. <laughs> <laughs> I had a principal point that out. Are you, are you a geologist as well? Or? <laughs> Jack of all trades. These, these single pages, and, and, I, and I talked about this for some time last year before we distributed them to every classroom in every school. We used to have flip charts, and you maybe have seen some of those hanging on doors, and, and our efforts were to go away from the flip chart because in an emergency, Who's going to flip through 17 pages of a flip chart to find what you do in a lockdown? This has the major <coughs> expectations, and if you had to, you could just refer to it and say, that's what we're going to do, and you don't have to have a flip chart. So you know, I'm sure that they still exist out there, Alan. You probably see them, and you probably say, actually, we, uh, we don't have those anymore. When I showed these to uh, Gilbert and Chandler, they're going to. Fact, uh, Chandler and their Alhambra are actually using the exact same. Oh, they're changing this a little bit. Oh, that's, that's flattering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So today, as we look at these slides, what I would really ask you to think about is what do we want our schools to look and feel like from a safety perspective? Okay. So, so we, you know what we've done so far. And we're getting ready to spend some more money on this. And, and, and before we spend money, I don't, I, I have a fear that we will do something and then we will, you know, five years from now say, why did we do that? Why did we do that? So I'm trying to be thoughtful about that, but I would like to hear from you about what works, what doesn't, um, what, what you think we should be focusing on when we do these um, models. And so we're just going to walk through some current pictures of some current lobbies, um, not necessarily the ones that we plan on doing. But um, Al's going to point out some of the challenges with them as we go through them so you can kind of see. And then if you know of challenges with these lobbies, please join in because that's what this is uh, for the next few minutes here is, is designed to do. And then I'll show you some designs of what's out there in the world, what's being designed in other school districts in Arizona so you can kind of see what's, what's going on. Okay? And a short time ago, Holly set me straight and uh, <laughs> she said, don't look at don't begin to build a safety philosophy by first thinking about cost. You know, try to, to look at it from the standpoint of what looks right, feels right, uh, what are the hurdles in a particular design, and then we'll think about the cost 
after we figure out our philosophical position. And, and she and really kind of. We turn down when you turn down a few lights, it's hard to yeah, really, really see the two seasons. So it's not about no, not, we no, oh, it's not that we're gonna so blow the budget on these, but, but the idea is that with our partners, um, our architect partners and designers, we'll we'll look for ways to incorporate um, cost effective design that meets the philosophy that we set. So, start talking about him. So, at, at most of our campuses, the biggest challenge when we were trying to create one point of entry was funneling everybody into the front office and then figuring out a way for them to get into the campus. So, what we had to do is bring the fences out the way you see them here at Hale. Uh, and then, in a lot of the schools, we had to cut in a secondary door so that when they come in, they check in and then they go out the other door. So. I can't remember here if the door's on this side or this side, but let's just write I like your pointer, Al. What? I like your pointer. You like that? <laughs> uh, so you'd walk in. Uh, on most of them, we have a buzzer door lock on the secondary door so that you can't just do a button hook and get into the campus. Um, again, aesthetically, maybe it isn't the nicest looking, but it's, it works as far as safety. It gets us into the front door. There's accountability. So I, I've looked at these campuses from, I kind of, you know, arrived at the district <coughs> after the fencing went up, and I completely respect what Al has done and how he's had to do it. But I think we also, it, it is frustrating to have the front of the school be kind of nothing but fence, right? Yes. And, and, and then this little shoot to get through. <laughs> um, so you know, there's the, this is the balancing act. How do we, how can we readdress some of these? You know, the, the quick answer was get the fences up and get the campuses secure. The longer conversation is, can we make some slight changes to some of that front? And maybe the fence doesn't have to be quite as prominent in, in, in walking up to the school. And, and you should know that when we were doing the superintendent search pamphlet, remember you said yeah, you had yeah. a picture on Get there. The can, you, can you take the fence out of there? We chuckled because that's what our campuses look like. Yeah. It, you know, so it, it, you said take that out of there. Well, but that's us. That that's what it looks like. Well, yeah. one of the challenges I know this is going to come up, so I'm probably jumping ahead. It's hard to find offices in some of the schools. Oh, and I'm wondering. We're, we're going to get to that. Okay. Yeah, we, yeah. So, we agree. Well, you're That's absolutely good. right. So I, I'm glad you went there because one of the design things I told you about was territorial design, right? And what the idea is, is that you should use your landscaping and sidewalks to, to guide you. Think about how many planter boxes we have put to make the fronts of schools look beautiful, but they cut the sidewalk up. So there's no clear path. To go to the office in many cases. Say, a big giant sign. Well, office. I've got some examples of that too. So yes, thank you for going there. So that's for sure. But like Hale here, that's a great example, right? You didn't, if you didn't see the cattle shoot getting you to the door, you might not know that's the front office, right? This is one of the better ones. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I wanted to bring up is once you are in the office, yes, to get onto main campus, you have to be buzzed in, but that's just a little swing gate back there that lets you right back into on the right hand. So there's not much stopping you if you're getting it. Westwood. So Westwood is uh, wide open. Uh, when you walk in the front door, clerk sits here. But uh, if you've been to Westwood, you'll know that there's a lot of landscape there, and a lot of when it gets crowded in there, it would be very easy for somebody to walk straight into here to go to campus. Uh, uh, straight down that hallway. Straight down this down hallway down here, and. And there's a couple different ways you can get into campus without even being. And the clerk sits there, but with your back to the door. That's right. That's right. That's right. So when we walked this uh, a couple years ago, uh, you made a comment that Westwood was one of the easier ones to fix because there is so much landscape that it would be easy to build some type of waiting <coughs> area there yeah. that would stop people from going on without getting. We've done a nice job of labeling the office, the outside. You can tell where you're going when you pull up to Westwood. Oh, yeah. you, know, you know where you're going, but the inside needs some work. So we're, we have some hodgepodge. That's why one answer doesn't fit for everybody. Funny because the remodel was so recent. Yeah. And now we have to go back. So 
this whole project is going to be like 10. I hope so. Remodel address the exterior did not. That's right. No, the that would have been. We did the office Could've how many years ago? It it's been a long time. Like, <coughs> Fifteen years ago, twenty maybe when we did the office. Yeah. Well, yeah. when we when we did the remodel left of the building, we did the exterior a little bit. But... Yeah. So this is Pomeroy. Again, the the uh, <coughs> landscaping doesn't lead you to the front door, right? So you would think that's the front door, right? This is the front door. Mm -hmm. You have parents now. <laughs> I go up to that. <laughs> got Al I still go up to that. Yeah. And, and how, like, per your conversation, <laughs> it's hard when you enter from the parking lot. The front door is actually over that fence and planter box to the left. Yeah, the parking yeah. lot's back right. here. Right? So you would have to walk way around this planter to go this way. Yeah. Right here. It doesn't direct you to the front. It doesn't direct no. you to the door. Through landscaping and other. And then once and you're, you're in, you know, it's, it's an evidence of your life. Hostin. Hostin is kind of like uh, Westwood. You walk in the front door, the clerks are all on the right. You can either go straight ahead and get into campus. If you go left, this is the principal's office and some clerks are over here, and you can actually get to the nurse's office and get out there that way. If you remember, if you've been to Hostin, you know their entrance also kind of sits on the side of the building as opposed yes. to the front. And an AMO. Yes. Yeah. And you do see those kind of lobbies, but there's that you can't go. You can maybe walk in, but you can't go past that. So you check in with the office. So that's where you. It's not always unusual to have it off to the side, but the idea that you can't keep going <laughs> is what you gotta try to address. Redbird. So front door is right on the other side of this pillar, and. Uh, we talked about the fact that back when we did the fencing, it would have been nice to cut a door right here and made this a nice entryway. It would have closed this off and made the front door the exit door to the campus. But we didn't have the funds for that. So put the fence back here, cut a secondary door to the uh, left of the front door. And the other thing about Redbird is these windows, they're not see through windows, they're like bathroom windows, I call them. So that you can't see, blocks. you cannot see outside at all. Well, somebody's inside. One of the things we want you to think about is the two things that I'd like to think about as part of our <laughs> philosophy is the fact that you can see who's coming and that you can secure it quickly. It would be two two things I would recommend that we try to design around that that the idea that the people in the office can see who's coming at them and that way they know uh oh something's bad's about to happen and I can and then I can quickly secure wherever wherever we are. Really makes a good point that I had should have thought about, and that is you see so many that are closed off, but that makes the people inside more vulnerable, That's in my right. opinion, mm -hmm. because there's so many places they can hide to get in where nobody could see them. That's right. I really had many years ago the uh, all the Circle K's and the 7 Elevens they were getting robbed all the time because they had their whole front closed off with uh, signs and. Such. So you couldn't see the clerk, and the clerk couldn't see out. And there was a big push in working with the police department to try to clear those windows, reposition the clerk so that they could see the parking lot. That way, the bad guy sees the clerk. He's less likely to actually go in and chickens out, or the clerk will see danger coming, and then the nine one one lock the doors. Well, that's good news because I like more of Yes. This is Field Elementary. So when you walk into Field, uh, you can actually, I wish this picture was in the back uh, because you can actually go left into the nurse's office and out into campus, or you can go right. The principal's office is way over here, and right down the hallway, and you're into campus. If the clerk is distracted, go near it. Uh, this one would be a pretty easy one to fix because uh, when I was thinking about this one, we could build some type of a barrier here and two doors on each side of this. It's a pretty base cost. The front, yeah. start front. The other thing we'd like to try to get away from is when we do let parents in, you don't have to walk them through mail rooms and you know back um, conference rooms or back uh, <laughs> nurses' office. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. That that is a that is on many of our campuses, including field. That's what you do. You walk by by mailboxes and and spaces where teachers gather. We hope you maybe could avoid doing that. 
Well, if you think about the original design, people would check into the office, walk back out, and just walk onto campus to go wherever yes. they were going because there were no fences. So we created a whole new path, traffic oh, pattern by funneling people to the office. But those offices don't always have a way to get out on the campus without technically coming back out the front. And that's where we end up with some of the fences right up on the front of the campus. Irving is another one. As you can see, you have to walk up uh, visual aid to see who's coming. Uh, and then the door to get into campus is just to the right. So you come in and you, look. you walk in, you have several doors you can go through. Mountain View, you know, <laughs> one of my favorites. Yeah, but you know, Mountain View is kind of set up in a way nice because they already have the big windows here. We just have to some type of a waiting area and barrier here. Uh, but this, if, the, if we set up these clerks the right way, and they couldn't see the danger. So there are a lot of windows there. Unfortunately, the doors are kind of the they're kind of the center of what they'd be looking out at if you wanted to see the, the parking lot. So it's it, you're right. I the windows out, but then the doors are completely blocking the, the very entrance. Somebody might come up through. Well, this like, picture kind of there. Show it, but we did add a ramp to the to the front doors this year. So this past past year, they've gotten a ramp to get in there also. And that was so we could. Fence. We changed the fencing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, the issue was the fencing was really out around the parking lot and never used. So the campus was really never secured like the other campuses. So. Yeah. Once you move the fencing back between the buildings, now you create new traffic patterns. That's why we had to build a ramp up to the front office because you couldn't use other ramps there. Fences were originally there to keep the students from Yeah. It wasn't about, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Different, 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 different time. time. Ishikawa is one of those ones we have to walk to the back to get out. On the Plus, there's no direct line to get to the door. You have to walk around the last Beautiful turf, but. <laughs> Not a direct path to the So these Bush is one of the uh, <laughs> schools that we had to, where I told you you had to exit the hallway. So before these doors weren't here. So when you walk in the front door, you literally had to go through this door to get to the office, and people were just walking right into our campuses. We've had versus stolen classrooms or recess. So this was kind of a simple fix. All we did was we put in a set of double doors with a buzzer. So they, uh, instead of a window here, we took the window out and put in a pull down the security shutter. So when they're in lockdown, they just put it on. And then this also has a buzzer lock. So people come in, check in, and then they either get buzzed into the office or they get buzzed in. Okay, well, I have a question about this one. And I'm really familiar with this grandchildren. When I come in, when I come into that entrance, it feels very unfair very closed in and you feel like you're going into a prison <laughs> and, and to me that looks like you and I'm not being critical I really am not I just want I have this is an honest question and I, there's a lot of things that the person behind that wall can't see so I'm wondering is there a way to make that feel friendly if that's the design where we need to go to and I see it's an easy with that one, I, I understand that. Is there a way to make that feel? Well, I think different? one way would be to cut this out and put it in all glass. That would be one glass one windows one. and just open it up. Well, and I there's we have several that like well, it's a talk around oh, yeah, Red Mountain Ranch know. Elementary. A lot of them look this have the same. Everybody I've heard the secretaries yeah. joke about how they like, you know, they had to who's, shoot pull, for, who's pulling down who's uh, pulling down the bank? To, like I know when the shooters <laughs> in, who are they sacrificing to protect the rest of them? Really that's safe. No, unless it happens on another place, but if it comes in the front door. I would tell you though, that overhead door, they demonstrated it to me, it comes down quickly and it gets latched quickly. If we need a mechanism to be able to be able to secure the area. Well, there's gotta be some kind of door or mechanism to close. Yeah. And I'm just saying that and I'm just saying around your ankle because you're running. Right? That yeah, just touch yeah. your ankle and close it. <laughs> well, so it's just okay. one thing. It can it can be secured quickly. 
they can't see the danger coming. So right. it doesn't that's, fit both right. pieces. Right. And, it, and it looks uninviting. There you go. You know, right. right. So that's you know, how do you feel when you enter, right? Just so you know, well, there's a couple of the ones we had to replace. They had electric motors that shut it, but it took like two minutes to shut it. So we got rid of those. Oh, they just took two. Yeah. Yeah. I am um, listening to what you're saying. I feel totally different about this because I've seen some um, the different picture with actual with actual class and the idea of how I see it. Being I'm a kind of different thinker, I actually think it's almost um, fair for the. Um, I see it as a transaction window, and I understand we don't do transactions. Might I meet you, greet you, you then have you go on and do what you need to do. I'm not coming there. To but to actually have that last, I I think that's the worst thing for people to come up and watch you where you work. They're just kind of hanging out. They got some kids, and you're in there doing your work. So like exposing that, just having it open and like, I understand the safety thing, but I also look at the people in there. It's like, why are people watching people work? Because that's what it is. It's lobby where people are going back and forth. So that's kind of how I look at it. And of course, yeah, highly unfortunate thing about the expense. I'm like, come there, people <laughs> see you, don't see you, got a fix, and you move on. And it's faded. I'm, I'm thinking maybe we'll change the color, make it bright, make it cherry. <laughs> so these are the ones that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. These are the ones we've redone this last summer uh, Washington and Sousa. Um, they were very open. They they didn't have that opportunity like Bush did with the hallway where you could just do a transaction window. They they had just desks out that people walked up to. So this was our solution. Um, it it does a couple of things. It allows for line of sight. People can see who's coming. Uh, it allows it to be pretty quickly uh, secured. The doors aren't exactly what we'd like. We would do a different design moving forward. Um, and that was why we did two this year to see what worked and what didn't. And uh, the doors have to be shut like this, and then um, secure. See how they're open right here. And they and take out the open. counter space that we would prefer they don't take out because it, it basically that makes it unworkable space there because of, of that. So we let we're going to redesign them moving forward. The design would be <coughs> a pull down for a transaction window. The staff, I asked the staff at Sousa how they like like this. They had a kid about it. Yeah, it was going to get hit, but um, they do that very proper type of humor. But uh, but they they like the openness. They they actually the, the ladies like this. They think it's they think it's good. They think it's still inviting. It's still um, and it, and it is it is still inviting. But they make look how they make it so homey. Yeah, curtains you know, and everything. Stuff, you know. The the um, and the light is coming in. Yeah. I think that's what really is, is the nice light. about is that it's got the light. We do have. Um, you want to talk about the film? Sure. We did put the ballistic film on all this glass, so right. it is bullet resistant. I, I know that, but when that window's open, that's what that's right. That's about. right. So right now it's a key, and um, they're getting ready to switch them out to a, a thumb lock, basically that will that they can close it and. Click it and it'll be locked. So they're, they're, they're getting ready to change those locks out. I think it's important to point out here too that on these projects that, um, and I, I guess this really came home to me when I was uh, visiting LA and uh, Holly and I went to a conference about design and we did a, one of the best school tours I've been on uh, with LA Unified. And they have a master plan and they're working on these buildings. and what was interesting to me is when they when they pick a campus to go work on, they pick it because of seismic activity. They say, if the building's going to fall down, those are the ones we got to fix first. So that's <laughs> their reason. Criteria. Yeah, pretty good criteria. But yeah. that's the reason they go and master plan that campus. But they don't say, OK, there's two buildings that are going to fall down, and the other four are going to stay up. Their campuses are very similar to ours, the open you know, campuses that we've built over the years. They say, okay, those two buildings have to come down. Now, school, we're going to master plan what your campus needs going forward. And they look at the whole campus. They don't just look at the two buildings that need to go down and the two new and put two more buildings up. They say, 
do those buildings still meet the educational needs of the students and do we need to make changes? I bring that up here because in these offices, what we saw was a lot of dysfunction with the way things were laid out and how the traffic patterns occurred. So we didn't just put up this transactional counter, that was part of it. But for example, at Washington, they had that kind of fence in the middle of the door that we saw earlier at I think Hale, was it right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you kind of walked into the fence. But they had this window right next to it. And as you can kind of see in this picture, we took that and you kind of see a light down there, you can't see it, but we cut out the, the uh, window and made it a door. And we were able to move the fence off of the front entrance. So the front entrance opened up and you didn't walk into a gate anymore. And it just, and you still have this traffic flow where a parent can be buzzed through and now walk out onto the campus when it's appropriate. So you still maintain all the security. We were able to change the fencing a little bit. So we looked at it with more than just the, we're just trying to fix one little problem. We're trying to address the entire experience of how you interact with the office and move through the office. At SUSO, we saw that front office was kind of dysfunctional. They had all these kind of like makeshift pieces of furniture slapped around because that's what they had. And they had a desk here that they got out of surplus and a desk there that they got a surplus of 12 different kinds of furniture. So we redid the, the back countertops as well as creating that transactional counter. And oh, by the way, they had this one storage space that was completely useless and with like this flip of a switch, we were able to turn that into an office that they're now able to use just by kind of uh, putting in a, a wall and a door that was very inexpensive and reasonable. So there was a little bit more going on here than just the idea of the transaction counter, but we're trying to make the front office function better at the same time, not just be about um, how do we capture people in the lot. Probably knowing that we only have about 12 minutes left, let's make sure that we, we get to a spot where we can get some final feedback. Yep. Here's Taylor. This is the remodel for Taylor. Remember, we moved it from the center of campus to the, um, the exterior of campus there. Um, I tell you, I don't know if you've talked to any Taylor parents or Mesa High parents. They think this is the best thing since sliced bread. This is super exciting. This is a great design. Um, we are going to make a change here. That's a big pull down door, and nobody's strong enough to. So we're gonna we're gonna alter that design this summer to make it a little easier. There'll be a transactional window and glass on the side, um, but it'll make it a little easier for it to secure. Because right now, it's a, that's a beast of a door. To pull down. And there also are windows on the other side that you don't see there, so they do yes, see they see what's coming out under the parking lot. <laughs> oh, I do have a picture. So now I want to just show you some examples of designs that are um, in our area. This is Queen Creek Middle School. You can See they have the transactional counter. They have windows that people can see. They can see who's coming into their lobby. And that light idea that you were talking about. And they, took the hat and they have the four inch or six. They have like a gap. gap underneath, which is. So you see glass all the way around and just a transactional gap. Okay. Like a okay. bank. Someday. Here's Cheyenne Traditional. This is another redesign. You can kind of see the picture on the bottom there, what it used to be. And then the one on top is what it is now. This is the idea of, of clearly calling out where the doors are. So at Cheyenne, you might have thought that that door on the left up there was the front of the school. But it was by putting that blue kind of metal work around the front door, now you've called it out and you've put a clear signage. So this would be another um, feature that we would add to make sure that offices clearly know where you're going. Clearly know where you're going. See, they used to have a sign that said office now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it does look like the one on the left. Is I would have gone on the left. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we can do better with signage and calling it out. Gateway Polytechnic, again, the idea of a transaction window, uh, secure doors to get Buzz back in. They're a nice area for people to, to wait and or be seen as needed. And Holly, I think maybe a real important part, even, even this one as well, <coughs> that, that if we're going to have glass in my opinion, it need, they need to be able to see people coming. They need to be able to secure whatever that area is. And in a lockdown, they need to be able to retreat to a place of security. And maybe if you go back to the last one, Holly, it's maybe, maybe more appropriate, is the notion that 
that's probably a conference room or a workroom back there. So if they were in a lockdown, they would secure the glass and go behind that door to be secure. This design doesn't really have a way to secure the glass because it has that four inch gap. Which or is, six inch gap. Which is secure. Like I like that better. You know, than a door? Well, yeah. Okay. It's not a action remember to do this. It's, it's yeah, it's just secure. Yeah, the only uh, drawback with having a gap on the bottom is still shoot through it. And some of these uh, that we are gonna see, I think are 10 inch gaps. Okay. And I think a, a lot of kids could probably get through that. And a lot of these shoots are. Here's Kyrene. This is the basically the design they they deployed in most of their schools. They and do the, have the gap there too. On the top and the bottom. On right? the top and the bottom, yeah. This is the idea of using the, the planter boxes in a smart way to lead you into the school as opposed to like block the uh, path into a so these are the schools that we scheduled for the summer. Um, you can see the list there. The, and they have all different needs, right? All different places across the district. Say, isn't Eisenhower, is Eisenhower the school where you have to walk? Uh-huh. It's it's yeah, yeah, and it's like down to the office. Uh -huh. I always think that's so unsafe because I think I've passed 80 kids mm -hmm. on my way to the office. Yes, yeah, you have. Like, and kind of like what Taylor was. You got that. Yeah, if it was campus. an active shooter, they're already in the middle of your campus before they're even at the office. Sue brought that yeah. up in a meeting. Well, we have a lot of them. <laughs> This is just, it. just strictly for security. Other, other things you're going to do is completely separate. That's exactly right. This is this is these are the schools that just need an office. They're not in, identified in any other way in the master plan yet. The planner boxes. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. When we think about multiple goal type of uses on those planner boxes. So like a school garden or yeah, yeah okay. I know Madison is very big on that. Yeah. Um, yes, I think also that's schools that schools yeah. community yeah. gardening or something. But the, but the problem is you, you, you can, can, you can actually put something until like the stuff grows out. Like, because I remember I've seen like when we first started the one at Johnson, Gloria Johnson, even though it's in the middle of campus, I remember for it to have aesthetics and I'm trying to be things like on the side until the yeah, I, I just I would just worry about kids taking the time and teaching take the time to some idiot. Because it's on the outside, outside on the outside. Right side. You don't want to get that's what I would worry about. And you've got you've got like our uh, homeless come and pick all the vegetables. You know, like you've got people experience. Well, at least they leave. Especially going to trash it. We got cameras on. So we talked to you. About, <laughs> no, who it is? So we talked to you. We talked to you about the security film. Uh, sure. We we uh, Washington and Sousa are completely uh, installed with the security film, and we want to move forward with the all the schools. If any, the concept is that everywhere where there's a kid behind the glass, we want to be able to put something like that, especially in the areas like the cafeterias where it's all. We have some classrooms that are all class. We're starting with L uh, junior highs and high school. Yes. For now. They're the most likely. And then we've talked to you about the security alert beacons at Guerrero. That that test is going well, and we'd Very like well, to then, increase yes. that. The principal's here. Yes. Going well. And the we're, intent we're of, so they know the intent well. of the security beacons are what? So that in areas where it's hard to hear the announcement. Like in the band room, the orchestra, the cafeteria, the playground, we put these blue, blue strobe lights. And uh, when there's a lockdown, they hit a button, the lights start blinking, and that lets everybody know we're in lockdown. Because if we get a lot of complaints <coughs> from gym teachers and band leaders that say, I didn't hear anything. So uh, this will alleviate that. So we're moving forward with all the campuses. I think we can soon have all. And then, David, do you want to talk about the emergency notification system? Sure, that's how we mentioned the. Um, the campus quickly. We're looking at a system that will, you know, basically put out be able to push one button and send a text message, email, message to the phone, play an announcement over the intercom, and that. Uh, lock down the school or a group of schools or the entire school. We're looking at a system like that. And also work with the uh, <coughs> blue lights. Sends a notification to the district also, yes. so to Al's office, so that there's not, so when the principal, um, 
puts the school into lockdown or is told by the police to put the school into lockdown, they don't have six calls to make. The system takes care of it for them. And they can take care of the kids and the teachers in the way that they need to. It also allows us to use multiple communication methods because <clears throat> I guarantee you when something goes wrong, it's going to happen at the most inconvenient time as far as being, you know, kids are being released to the bus or they're out in um, the playground or they're during lunch. It never happens when everybody's just in the classroom. Um, so communicating with our staff who might be anywhere um, it becomes a critical issue at that point because you know, they don't care. The one thing that everybody carries around now is their cell phone, right? You don't know if they're going to be next to a walkie-talkie. You don't know if they're going to be next to an intercom. But they're probably going to have their phone on them. So all those communication methods, hopefully, you get to everybody quickly. So, so, I can ask you. Sure. Yeah. So things have changed since I was a teacher, right now. So now, teachers left. What do we have in the classroom? The shooter is already there. The shooter is the kid that's on your right. What does a teacher do when the classroom door is locked? We can get in that room. The shooter is already inside. So the emergency notification system okay. is an app that the teacher can also press to Who's notify voice, people. Yeah. So they do an app, or they can you know push a couple of bugs on the phone. You know, everybody, hey, that I need help. Or their desktop. Or desktop. Or their desktop. So cool. it's, what, what do you, okay, wait, what? It's gonna be hard. Because, okay, a female teacher does not have their phone on their phone. Well, it's in their purse. But their desk it's, phone and their lap and their laptop. They're using. Be they're using. Okay, so it's on the it's on the phone. It could be on, it could be on the phone. On their, their phone. Computer. But on their computer. And their phone. And their, and their desktop. Uh, phone. Well, 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 phone there's computer, multiple ways. And, okay, got it. Well, okay. But, but Marcy, aside from that moment of of notifying through some electronic system. Al, you want to speak briefly on that when there is an altercation with a shooter, there are are things that that uh, police tell you to do that that you flee, you you know, if you hide, you flee, and then you protect yourself. So you want to talk briefly about that? Well, because we've been talking about the shooter coming from the outside, yep. and we know that most shooters are already on campus. Uh, most, when you look back at the dynamics of a shooting, most of the kids that bring these guns in and their backpacks, they go to a bathroom and then they suit up. Then they come out and then they start looking for targets. Uh, if and there has been cases where they've been in the classroom, they'll take a classroom hostage. Uh, what we've taught our staff and we uh, instructed them to teach the kids is to fight. If it's that kind of a situation going to pick up a chair and just start chucking it at the guy. And I mean, but the protocol you're, you're talking is the about first the, thing you do is what out. So it's, it's shelter in place, uh, we or fight. So we're talking about front offices right now, but we'll come back with another conversation about mostly the idea of locked classrooms and how do we, once we start to master plan these campuses, are there ways to lock corridors? Are there ways to, to be different? But this first, this first level of um, planning that we're doing is around the offices. So I just want to do a quick touch base. Where are you with the ideas that they need to be able to see what's coming at them and be quickly secure? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Um, from there, then, um, are there any other big ideas that you'd like us to make sure that we incorporate into these designs? What's important to you? Windows. Windows are important. Right? And I know the windows will be more expensive because we've got to make sure that they're a certain type of It seems like visibility is really important, but light into the office, that those that those workers in there have, have light. Um, because I'm thinking Guerrero, and you don't have any light. What's that? They don't, don't have any light. light here. They don't have a window. You don't have a window. And I'm wondering, you know, they don't. I'm thinking that that situation is, is, is a good that, that situation um, at Sousa where the windows are on the side too. I mean that's really it's really visible and 
I like the welcoming of the, the windows for the protection, but I also like the landscape idea. I think the landscape idea could really, really work. So paying attention to how people enter and making yes. sure that we have some clear path. And it's one idea as well. And welcoming as well. Okay. And then be able to identify the front office. Yeah. And find yeah. No word is. Yeah. 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 And that may have something to do with sure. designating mm -hmm. how people visitors are. Sometimes you go on a camp and, campus and you can't tell well, what would be the most convenient place to park. I just want to run and walk. Right. And maybe that that get, that's quickly remedied after the parents been there once. I know anybody who hasn't. I think it makes it a challenge. Yeah, Mesa High is yeah. one of your huge yeah. so, challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Huge challenge. So the reason way, way harder to fix that one then. So the reason why no. we're talking about this now is that simply changing the front office isn't in and of itself <coughs> a wise use of our dollars. Because we will change it to fit something that is not functional at our schools. And so we want to be able to go back with the architects to say, all right. If philosophically we believe this, let's get some drawings of exactly what you guys are talking about. And I, I think there's a balance in all that we do. I like Taylor. I, Taylor has, you know, somewhat of a, a structured front area when you get in. It's not, you know, a 30-foot wall of glass that there's countertops. And if we design it in a way where maybe there's two pull-down windows instead of one, then we can do something better. Yeah. So I would tell you, I'm not a fan of everything just being glass everywhere. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we can design beautiful things with openness, with the ability to see, the ability to lock down. You know, and, and I don't know what, what well, you guys think. I like the Taylor environment. I think it's... I'll be, yeah. and realistically, cost, as much as we want to say, it cost does matter. Yeah, so if it's beautiful, but it's three times as much, then I want to live with less beautiful. We get it. And more. I'm budget. very. I'm yeah. very. <laughs> and more budget friendly. I'm very cheap. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm seeing two things. I mean, glass, glass, and it can mean life. But I think there's other things that actually create life, like those side windows. <coughs> there are windows, but they were kind right. of like. So I understand. Right. So I think there's all. So I remember seeing like some <coughs> overhead um I like kind yeah of, mm -hmm. type um things so uh, I think there's some, yeah, there's you know, some now we have a skylight good light. lighting. Good lighting. Sure. Sure. And, and in fact it's not an lighting. architect or person who can actually make illusions <laughs> to to create the field. Okay. So we'd like to probably, <laughs> you know, with our architect here, Holly, do you envision us? You know, getting some designs of these schools, <coughs> you know, trying to figure out costs of what something like this would look like, being able to share it with the, the board and saying, here's where we're headed. Yes, very much so. Okay. I think one more thing to ask her then from Scott saying that we should, and also I think the board was supportive, and that is to look at the traffic flow. Sure, are, are we, are we or traffic, how to get to campus? And, yeah. It, when campuses were originally built, you came in, then you could go out throughout the campus wherever now. Before well, there were no the fences. Where, yeah, there were no fences now. Have we, have we disrupted the traffic flows? What I heard Scott was saying. Yes. Sir. Well, I think the, the so, Taylor example, like there was no way to fix the office being in the middle of the campus. It, it, we tried that, and you saw what happened. We had a cattle shoot with a dumpster, and that's how you <laughs> entered the school. I mean, it was embarrassing, and it wasn't appropriate for the kids. I mean, it looked there was nothing but fence everywhere. So we had to move that camp, that that office to a new location to create a new work way of flowing through the campus and controlling <laughs> access. So it just, sometimes it's not as simple as, sometimes very simple and sometimes a little more complex on how we're gonna address those. So I think Thank we you. can continue this conversation because it is already yeah. wide after the hour. Move into the next session so we don't have to recess. don't even have to recess. Okay. Okay. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye.